Welcome to In Response, interviews with intriguing internalizers. My name's Mia Park, and I have the honor of introducing my Tai Chi teacher, Patrick Kelly. He is my Tai Chi teacher and is a longtime Tai Chi and spiritual teacher. Uh, Patrick was born and raised in New Zealand, but has studied all over the world and has students internationally. So I live in Chicago, Illinois, and study with students of Patrick there. However, I've also traveled to China and Europe to study with Patrick because he has schools and students there. Uh, Patrick has a couple books out. One that I highly recommend is called Infinite Tao because that gives you a lot of insight to Patrick's personal journey, looking for really solid, valid teachers and teachings. So if you want to learn more about Patrick the person and his journey, I recommend that book. But here you are live and in person. Hello. Yeah. So is there anything else you'd like people to know about you? No, you pretty well summed it up. I think. <laughs> okay, cool. There's not, not very much it needs to be known. I think the, the questions will reveal more. Just ask it. You ask away. Great. So can you help us understand what the outside world is for you? What that looks like for you? The outside world? Um, well, I think of the whole earth as one. And I try to move freely over the earth. Um, that's why I've got students um, everywhere. Students in America, students in... Um, I travel wherever I can and I think of the earth as one place. And I try to not get caught by the borders of the countries and the governments insisting that they have individual countries and so on. I don't especially believe in nationalism and I, you know, that you should be proud of your country or something else. I think you should be proud of the whole earth. And I think it's good when people can move freely over the whole earth. That's how it should really be. The earth's one place. Hmm. That's my outside world. Do you consider the earth as a living organism? Um, in one sense, yes. I consider that there's a, a, an intelligent being that manages the earth. But if you think of the, the dirt, that's like thinking of your finger as an intelligent, um, as a, as an intelligent being. It's not really. It's just a part of your body. So the earth, as we see, is part of the body of an intelligent being. Hmm. That's great. Uh, can you share with us what your internal response is or how you engage internally with that outside world you just shared with us? Engage internally with the outside world? Um, well, I think the, the outside world and the inner worlds exist simultaneously at all places. So um, as I go about, as I move freely through the outside world or attempt to move freely through the outside world, um, then I attempt to take care of whatever um, inner responsibility arises at that particular place where I am, and that will also determine where I go at any particular place. So there's some simple things like family, and you know, I have four children. Um, sometimes I need to be places for those four children. My parents are dead, but there was a time when I needed to look after them. And then there's the students that I have, and um, wherever students sort of gather, um, then I feel some responsibility to move to that place for some time and do what I can. So at, at this stage, for the last 20 years, you might say, uh, I, I move through the, the outside world I'm in response to my, in response to the, um, the in, inside world. I don't just move through the outside world because of the outside world. I move through the outside world um, in order to take care of the things of the in, inside world. Hmm, that sounds like great advice for someone. Well, that's why, I, that's why I don't like restrictions on the outside world because it, otherwise it restricts the response to the, what's needed from the inside. Hmm. So because this is August 2020 and we're dealing with a global health pandemic right. in the outside world and the pandemic for racial justice right now, what kind of internal response do you have to those major global events that 
people are going through? Well, I, I personally think the present major event is just another example of the, um, the unbalance of the outer world. I think it's just a temporary and not overly major thing, so I don't overreact to it too much. I attempt to keep um, moving freely about in the outer world, um, to keep taking care of the, of the things from the inner world. Hmm. So I, I ignore as much as possible the overreactions of undeveloped people um, to the external perceived difficulties. Hmm. So I could see how someone might think that was a strong statement or might judge you for that because there's so much fear of the pandemic out there. Do you have a response to people who may judge you that way? Um, well, I, I'm, not, I'm not scared. I expect, if you live like I do, you expect to be judged by um, people who live in a different way. Mm -hmm. If people live their life um, in response to the external world, um, then they, they don't always, uh, they can't always understand, appreciate, and so consequently may um, attack or condemn somebody who, who lives in another way and, and I think it's just part of being in the world and um, at attempting to uh, take your cues and your responsibilities from the internal world rather than the external world. So people lost in the external world, um, you, you'd expect them to that's right, not understand, get angry, attempt to push you into their way of thinking. I just try to slip past them as softly as possible. Um, I think that's very encouraging to hear. I really appreciate what you, how you just explained, like what you do. I heard you say that you slip past them as I think you said as gently as possible. Right. I really appreciate that because mm. I think that there's so much action based on strong emotional um, feelings that people have. So I think that you responding that way to people who may judge you is a wonderful sign, a result of, of practicing. And I would think that people watching or just on your own, I think that people long to be able to respond that way, to slip past pressure with as much gentleness as possible in their individual lives. So can you maybe recommend or suggest to, say, the layman how they could possibly become that kind of person or have the fortitude to respond that way to life? Sure. Well, of course, in a sense, because we've taken Tai Chi as one of the central practices, um, of our central internal practices, of course, this is the speciality of Tai Chi to, um, to yield to and neutralize, not to really, not to go against, not to push back. Um, allow a certain pressure from the people from just um, to yield a little bit to it, neutralize a little bit and go on with your life. Not if you push back, then you um, you get stuck with the reaction and you get involved in the thing. That's that's from a looking at it from a Tai Chi point point of view, practically what it requires is um, that on a in your deeper self, you have a certain strength. And if you have that strength, then the outer self doesn't need to be so hard and inflexible because I can flex on the outside and the inside remains um, resiliently strong. There's no threat. So when I, when I give way a little bit to whatever people are pushing from the outside, I don't feel any inner threat from that. And if, if you don't have that inner strength, then you will push back and try to hold your position and defend it because there's, there's weakness inside. If you don't, you get squashed. Out of life will squash you if you don't hold your position um, unless you have something inside you that can't be squashed, like a strong resilience. And you can let the outside press on you and, and you'll just bounce back again. Mm. That's the way of looking at it. Uh, that's great. I guess for people who 
are new to Tai Chi or to you, let's start with the basics. So what to you is Tai Chi? Well, Tai Chi is a very big concept. It goes right back into Chinese um, philosophy. The concept of Tai Chi was the highest concept that really existed back in the time of when they, you know, the, the last wave of Chinese um, internal teachings from the Yellow Emperor. Um, we can say seven or eight thousand years ago. And Tai Chi was really the highest concept at that stage. Um, the Tao, the sense of the Tao didn't even exist. The word Tao wasn't used back in those days. So the word Tai Chi really meant the, um, the highest thing that you can conceive of. So that's the basis of it. And of course, the the Tai Chi, the Tai Chi Two or the Tai Chi diagram is the Yin Yang diagram, as people know it, which is, goes goes right back as well. Tai Chi. So Tai Chi is really the we can say it's a um, it's really a description of the whole universe. That's a, like a it's a very big thing. And then it was given to the um, more to find sort of art, the art of Tai Chi, only, we don't know how long ago, between 750 and 150 years ago. Nobody knows exactly when. There's records of it being given to Yang Lu Chan um, in the Empress Palace, maybe 150 years ago, 130 years ago. Um, so the, that's a little bit of the history. Just to take it from another point of view, um, Tai Chi is Tai Chi, as people know it, is really a, um, a part of the system for internal development. Just like, just like yoga is a part of system for internal development. That's how. It, that's why it was created. It came out of the the Taoist temples. Um, it wasn't just created as a martial art wasn't created as a martial art and then people tried to use it for internal development mm. any more than yoga was created as a, a body beautiful thing and then people tried to use it for internal development it's exactly the same there's no question that yoga came from um, a very high place and it was intended for an internal development and it has the yoga that starts with the body then the yoga that goes to the body's energy and then the, um, the deep emotions and then the, the deep mental and so on and then beyond. And that's a clear path of yoga. Um, no one says yoga started as a health and, health and beauty, and then they tried to make a spiritual path out of it. Um, some people say that about Tai Chi, but it's not true. It started in the same way as yoga. That's to say it was a, a part of a, the internal development of the Taoists. And then, just like the majority of people now take yoga as a, something for the body, a little bit of the mind. It's really lost its um, true connection. Um, same, the same with Tai Chi. A lot of people have just taken it as a, a little bit of health or some self-defense. Um, but that was not its original intention. So what makes the system that you teach different than the other Tai Chi systems you just explained that have lost their path? Well, it, the big difference, of course, is in the motive for doing it. So we, we begin, I began Tai Chi um, looking for a, an internal path, the path of internal development. That's how I began it. And so I, I met the teachers um, for whom that was true. And if you begin it as a martial art, you'll meet martial art um, Tai Chi people who've only taken a very small element of it. And if you begin it for your health, you'll meet teachers who have only done it for, for the health and taken it in that very small way, just like for yoga. Um, so I sought out teachers who, for whom, I really sought out teachers who knew something about the true internal training. That's to say, people who'd learned for a long time from their teachers who'd learned from a long time, back in chains of knowledge that came down from from above, and I wasn't looking just for a, an average, like local, um, 
you know, community center yoga class, tai chi class. That, that didn't interest me at all. So I sought out the people who, who were fully involved for a long time with good teachers on a good path. Um, and it just happened to be that some of the, the first teacher I met um, was using Tai Chi as the, we can say, as the, um, the physical introduction to the path. So, you talked about something from above, and then I think about the individual. So do you think that there's a deeper reason why each individual may want to or should develop their inner selves? Or is it just merely so each person can feel better and be happy or feel at peace? There's not the slightest, slightest doubt in my mind that people come onto the earth with one purpose, and that's for um, their own, for spiritual evolution, for their internal um, growth. That's the, that's the purpose on people coming here. But they quickly forget because the, the body and the brain consciousness is so strong that they just get lost in the outer world um, from a very early stage. And part of that problem is that all of the impressions coming in from their parents, from the schools, from the television, from the news, from the things they see is coming in on a very, very low level, a very physical-oriented level. And there's not that many high impressions that they receive. And so very quickly, their inner knowledge of why they're here, because every person comes in with that inner knowledge, is buried under the, um, under the uh, gross impressions that come in from normal life, what people think of their... Um, highly refined culture it was really gross impressions from a deep spiritual point of view and it buries the the knowledge inside people very early and then they get lost in life and forget why they're here but there's no no question that the purpose everyone comes onto the earth is for their internal evolution so why do some people not choose to internally evolve and why is it so hard to do it Why do people not choose it? Um, it's a very difficult question to answer because there's so many different situations for the people that come in. Um, I think that people, an individual doesn't escape the um, conditions created by the whole of humanity. So we don't come in free from all of the effects of the other humans. And if the mass of humans are uh, very body-centered, physical-centered, no, brain-centered, as part of the body, um, the individual comes into that situation and is quickly swamped by these the other billions of people who are body and brain-centered. And so that's that's one of the things that you you can't it's difficult for individuals to escape you might say the, the group karma of the whole of the human race um, and so although the whole human race is being slowly raised up it's a very 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 slow process and for one individual to try to accelerate themselves out of that and um, evolve themselves in this life, they have to go against the um, the mass of um, undeveloped people who aren't making that attempt, who are only being evolved slowly and unconsciously. So, in a in a sense, you have to break free of the the group the group and um, energy condition, the group karma, if you like to put it that way. Mm. So, I feel like there are words that can describe what you're talking about that have slightly different meanings that are very popular in other paradigms. Words like faith, love, healing. I hear those words describing self-development and I'm wondering why those words are not used in our Tai Chi system. Well, 
I mean, there, there is a whole inter, there are internal worlds existing simultaneously with the ex external worlds, and when the brain consciousness attempts to describe or um, describe or ascribe to uh, these internal worlds certain words, certain ideas, certain conditions, um, it's not the exact truth. So these words are not the exact truth. It's the brain consciousness of people attempting to um, describe it from an external point of view. So faith is comes across as you and your brain consciousness have to sort of like believe that there's something beyond that, something that's helping you and so on. Um, that's looking at it from the outside. This is really... It's, the, it's really the unconscious evolution of humanity that that's a part of. Because the conscious humanity is, you, you need to um, penetrate with your, with your mind into the inner levels. And then you don't have faith on what is there. You, you know what's there. Mm -hmm. So the faith is a, a belief from the external on the internal. And that can help people, but it's a part of the unconscious evolution, not the direct conscious evolution um, that's necessary for individuals to raise themselves quickly up. And so love is something similar, it's a similar type of thing. It's trying to trying to um, define or do something with the outer mind that's presumed to be like the condition that, that actually exists on an inner level. So if if you were to um, take yourself into the inner levels on one, to some degree or other, then the, the interconnectedness of people, for example, the interconnectedness of people or certain groups of people um, would become very clear. And just like a mother has like love, instinctive love for their children, then when you felt that interconnectedness, there would be a natural similar thing on that level. So it's not something that you think about from the outside and try to create love or imagine love on something. It's something that would be instinct instinctively obvious and felt if you were in on that level. <laughs> I'm just trying to describe the difference between ascribing qualities from the outside and attempting to duplicate them, to have faith, to have love, um, to be healing and so on, as opposed to um, taking yourself into the inner levels or attempting to do it, bringing your mind down to that level and beginning to work truly on those levels where, um, where, where you might say healing takes place, where love is, appears, where um, there's not exactly faith because it's... Uh, it's, um, you're absolutely clear that these things are existing. Mm -hmm. What someone on the outside might have is fair enough. Okay, big picture. Why are people born to work on their spiritual development? What's it all about? Well, when the picture becomes too big, it's too big for a human mind to um, appreciate. There are bigger pictures... Um, then the human mind can manage. So we have to bring it down to a picture that we can, I mean, my human mind, you know, while you're in a body. So we don't know that, nobody knows the ultimate purpose of life. Not even the good teachers who've lived for a hundred years or more that I know, and some of the teachers have lived for a hundred years or more, um, they don't know the ultimate purpose. They know beyond what I know. And... Um, some of them I knew over 30, 40 years. After 30, 40 years, they knew more than what they did when I first met them. Um, but the ultimate purpose of life, we can't quite um, be sure about. We can only know um, what is. And that is certainly that um, beings um, do come onto the earth. And this is the condition that we've been given. And these are the conditions that we accept. And um, when you come onto the earth, 
as one of my teachers said, a, a veil is drawn across your eyes. And that's a, that's a condition of, of life. Uh, in, in accepting, we, f we forget our past lives, we forget what the truth is on the inner levels, and that places us, here's why, from my point of view, um, that places us in a tremendous struggle with the forces of outer life, with the body, in ourselves, the body and the brain consciousness, which people think is everything, but it's just nothing, um, in ourselves, and the um, all of the forces of outer life, these big forces, you know, the, the governments, the, the legal system, the medical system, the financial system, um, all of these big things that push, the whole, push everybody around. So um, in order to um, develop yourself, a very big struggle is created between this small thing inside you, small real thing, and this big less real thing. And so that intense struggle to survive and grow um, produces, the, the intensity of the struggle um, produces a, an accelerated development. So once out of a body and back where you can see the external conditions and the veils are pulled aside up to a point, um, the, the intensity of the struggle drops right away and the the resulting growth is, is very, very small and slow compared. So this is a place where people can accelerate their growth. That's why, that's, why we are, that's why these difficult conditions are here. To encourage us to... Uh, it's a place of struggle. Mm. And we need that struggle to develop. A bigger struggle causes a, a, a bigger, um, bigger growth, that's right. I mean, everybody knows that you put, a, you put a child in the very easy conditions where they don't have to struggle at all, don't have to, they've got plenty of money, they don't have to work, they don't have to do anything and see what happens as they become a teenager and grow to an adult. And then you place another child in the conditions where they barely have enough food, they have to struggle, they, they want to be educated, they've got to walk you know, 30 kilometres to school or something. And that child, that child grows in a completely different way. So do you think that there is good and evil or better and worse, right and wrong? 100% yes. It, it's a <laughs> What's evil then? Okay, what is evil? You know, there, there's, a, there's a wrong concept that if you're developing yourself spiritually, you take on a sort of an equanimity where um, everything you see is equal and uh, that, that's a Absolutely, absolutely false thing. There's something from the outside, like the, the brain consciousness projects this idea that it imagines that that's what it's like. Um, in a sense, it's almost the opposite. So, what is evil? Actually, it's very easy to say. Um, in us, there, there is a very high part of us, our spirit, you can call it, the, the higher self, whatever you like to say, the real I, any of these things will do. And it only has a very delicate connection into us and is quite a small influence. But everybody um, can access that one to some degree. And it won't be able to run your whole life because the external is too strong. So whatever, whatever is in harmony with that very delicate, very high thing inside yourself, whatever is in harmony with it and helps it to establish and grow, and um, is good, and whatever is not in harmony with it and blocks its growth is bad. So, can an individual be evil, or is whatever is blocking them evil? Um, individual be evil. Well, every person, um, as as to the best of my knowledge, every person has this very very high, very pure thing inside themselves. So, if you take that as the person, then no person is evil. But then they have um, layers on that. And there may be, uh, some of these layers may be blocking and going against that very high thing in themselves. Some of the intermediate layers, some of the, we'll take the body and the brain as the most external layer. Um, the body and the brain may be working 
doing exactly the opposite of what this internal part um, needs, you might say. What's maybe completely out of harmony. And if it goes too far out of harmony, uh, you know, you're murdering, raping, um, whatever, um, then it's obviously, we can call it evil. I think that people ultimately want there to be peace and love and happiness and harmony, but individuals and collectives make so many decisions that are in that opposite direction. And then we have a penal system to punish the evil people or bad people, to try to, rehabil to rehabilitate them. And I don't really see those superficial systems working. There's no punishment from the inside, as I understand it. The punishment is like an external thing that people have placed on it, where the legal system um, punishes people. People don't get punished. In fact, they receive the, you know, when you go against your own internal part, um, uh, there's no real punishment for it. There's just a result. There'll be a result that you will need, you will need to deal with. That's all. Oh, I appreciate that. Because that, that makes me think of society trying to create peace by implying mores and values on a group that the group may not agree with. Right. Well, it's external morality. It's, um, it's of just no meaning from an internal point of view. So, Patrick, <clears throat> do you still have the same intention now behind teaching that you did when you started? Um, I would say it's just a yes. It's just a, a more refined, of course. My understanding of what I'm doing is more refined, but the basis of the intention is the same. I began teaching because, not because I wanted to, to be a teacher. I didn't really want to teach. I just wanted to learn. But um, I just came into the situation where people wanted me to teach because I had learned something. And I, I tried to avoid it in the beginning, you might say. So um, the Tai Chi people, because I learned well from a good teacher, then people wanted me to teach them, but really I wanted to just keep learning. So I began to teach. And, you know, I, I've never taught, I've never taught as my living. I refused to do that. And I've never really taught um, full-time. That's There have been periods where I, I've taught every day, but it's one class a day or something. I, I've never done five classes a day or anything silly like that. But for most of my life I've, for the last 20 years, for example, 25 years, maybe 30, um, I only teach seminars, and I maybe teach one every few months. And in between, I usually don't teach. So most of the time, I'm not a teacher. I'm a, I'm a learner. And, and I think that's the way it should be, that your learning is the basis of your teaching, and um, your learning process is uh, more work and... Um, time should go into your learning, then goes into your teaching. Otherwise it gets out of balance. So first, people wanted me to teach and asked me to teach because uh, they saw I knew something. And then later, my teachers asked me to teach. And then later, from inside, I'm asked to teach. So that's, that would be the evolution. That's why I taught, never because I want to be a teacher. That is great advice to make sure that you're learning more than you're I'm right. teaching. <laughs> so how will you know that you've been a successful teacher when your time comes to stop teaching? Well, I might even know before because you're watching. Um, my aim was always, my idea was if I can produce 100 competent people, and then each one of those can produce 100 competent people. That's 10,000. And each one of those produce 100. It's just like three generations. And we're up to quite a large number. <laughs> about, a, about a million people. That's, that's a million people competent. That, that would be a tremendous effect on the world. Now, it's obviously a little bit unrealistic, but that's, that's how I think of it. That's how... Uh, without being 
too over optimistic because I think if I spend my whole life and produce 10 competent, 100 competent people, that's not, it's not like I'm trying to teach tens of thousands or something like this one as some people do. And so I mostly limit my core group to 100. And that's, you see, the seminar we're just doing is 100 and I keep it at 100. But that 100 is drawn from a few hundred because some of them are on and off, coming, going. Um, so I have to have a few hundred in the background so I can draw a hundred um, who I'm... Um, and so I, I will know if it's a success if, if I do produce a hundred competent people who are now passing on something true in a world where there's so much, um, so much sp spiritual practices that are really just coming out of the smart brains of people and not really coming down from above. Do you have any regrets as a teacher? Um, I don't have any significant regrets. Uh, no. I'm just trying to think if I do. <laughs> Nothing comes to mind. That's great. Oh, I mean, I can say um, at every stage I look at what I'm doing and it always feels uh, not as well done as I would like, not as much energy as I would like to put into it, not as... Um, not as close to uh, what I feel is perhaps the ideal thing as possible. So at every step I see um, not quite, not perfect by some degree. And so that, but that's not really a regret. That's a, um, because I accept that because you, you just can't make perfect steps. What's your main wish for your students? Um, I think we could say my main wish for my students, of course, is to grow internally. And um, I, I believe every person who comes onto the earth, no matter where they begin, no matter what level they begin, can pull themselves through to the level where they don't need to come back onto the earth to continue their development. What some people think of it as some degree of enlightenment, which some people think of as a some big final step, but is really just a, um, it's just the stage where you can continue to grow without needing to come back into a body. So once the, once your being on a, on a slightly higher level grows strong enough, it's like a small child, um, it, it becomes, it, it, can, it can grow on in the internal worlds without requiring a body. And when it's very small, it will require it to come back in a body. So my simple aim is to bring as many of my students through to that level as possible. 100 competent people. Exactly. <laughs> so how do you see your future of teaching? What I have, have done over my um, 45-year teaching level is uh, as my own level raised naturally enough I can emphasize more, more the more internal aspects of the teaching so I, I could only teach the level I was on and 45 years ago I, you know I started 47 really 49 years ago I began I suppose of the internal things um, so you can only teach the level you're on although you can introduce the concepts of a level a little bit beyond what you what you know but can't really express. But as my own level raised, I was able to um, shift the, the emphasis of the training um, deeper into the system, if you like, you might say, um, to reflect my own understanding. And the hope was, of course, that the students, some of the students have been training 30, 35 years, that they were also... Um, their level was raising enough that they could also um, shift their training correspondingly. And the new people who were coming in uh, would usually adjust to it. So as my teaching was becoming more internal, um, it attracted new people who were more suited to that. Whereas in the beginning I attracted 
new people more suited to the level I was training. So um, everything takes care of itself in that way. Mm, almost like a self-selecting um, system. Exactly, yeah. Because I don't really advertise and try and get students in that way, I rely on um, people feeling a, finding about what I teach and, and feeling some uh, sympathy or uh, connection with it and coming for that reason. And that way you get the students who are suited for the time. Whereas if you just advertise wildly and made a lot of false claims or over-exaggerated claims, you would bring in a big mass of people, but most of them wouldn't really suit. Mm -hmm. Not designed to be there, and they will just leave after a while. You know, a person's guide can... Um, if, if the guide knows what's available, and when the person needs it, they will edge them towards the teaching that they need. So I would rather have these people um, flowing in uh, in not too great a numbers than just random people who happen to like the ideas or the pictures or want to get the power that they think is available and so on. So Patrick, you talk often about each individual having a guide. Can you explain more about that to people who are not aware of that? I'm sure. So this is the system that we come here in um, that every like every spirit or soul or whatever you like to call it, every individual um, who comes into a body um, in order not to get completely crushed and lost by the um, external world and the rough nature of all of the external for forces. Um, they, are, they are accompanied by um, some individual who has already raised themselves to a certain level, raised themselves just to the level where they don't have to come back in a body. Um, and that that person comes in with them, and we call them the the inner guide. And this has nothing to do with the spirit spirit guides of the shamans, the animal guides, and so on and so on. It's more like your guardian angel. Um, but it's not the angels of the angelic people who think they've got this angel coming and this angel coming and so on. It's really just somebody who's raised themselves up to the level of the third initiation, um, who's centered on the celestial or the deep mental level. Um, who doesn't need to come back in the body, but certainly hasn't completed their development, and um, they accompany a person in, and they maintain the connection. So they they serve both as a guide and a guard. Saying guard. A guard. Yes, mm -hmm. they guard the person. Um, they because otherwise the person can get lost in in a very complex in the complex lower levels of the world. So the. Um, the guide maintains the, the connection between the person's very highest part that we talked about. You know, what the person is really, the true self, and the outer self that's now expressing itself in the world. Otherwise, um, the, this connection w w is too tenuous and it will be um, crushed and blocked by the roughness of the external world. And the person can get lost, sort of like a lost soul or something. So the guide maintains that connection and um, also guards, guards the person from the, uh, from the forces on each of the levels that are not directly helping the pe person evolve. So if a person has made decisions in their lives to harm other people or do very egregious acts, mm -hmm. is their guide still hanging in there trying to protect them? Guide's always there, and um, uh, whenever you choose to do something, make an effort. The guide can um, can guide that effort, but they can't just do things to you. So you have to do something. So they're like in a in a passive situation, um, where if you choose to go somewhere, they can maybe. And guide you to find something a little bit better in that place, um, but they can't. They won't force you to go to another place or something like that because that's imposing on the free will of the person. So they have a gentle influence on people, and they're basically trying to influence people towards the things that will cause the inner growth and strengthen the connection with your deep self. Well, I think the system is built up in a great way where everybody has so much support available to them. 
And I just hope that people can connect with themselves and their guide because it seems like there's we have so much opportunity for self-development. The chances are all around us and we're so supported. I mean, you've been so kind to make your, you have several websites that are packed with helpful information. You know, you're doing this interview, you hold these seminars. Um, you've got many teachers that are teaching. So I feel like, well, thank you for setting the system up and that it's so available to so many people and for translating these like super, you know, esoteric or interesting and profound concepts. And you make them so relatable that, that we can watch this on a video and, and dial into what you're saying. So thank you. You're welcome. For the lay person who doesn't have a spiritual practice, who wants to begin self-development, how would you recommend they start? Well, I would recommend that they do some research. That they don't just go blindly find a local person who claims to be some sort of teacher. Um, in, in my time, when I began, there was no internet, didn't exist, um, but there were libraries. So I went to the libraries and I um, looked for the good books on these things and I read everything I could. So I had a, some sort of knowledge. And then, then I knew I had to find a teacher who really knew something. Not, not just the teachers who claim to know something and teachers who know little bits, but um, the teacher who really knew something about the internal system. And I didn't care whether they were a Zen Buddhist or a Sufi or a Taoist or, a, um, or nothing or some religion or not a religion. That had, I had no interest in that at all. I only knew that you had to find somebody who had genuine inner knowledge of the things and not just the outer knowledge that you so often get. And of course most of the books you find are just people with the outer knowledge. They don't really have the the depth of long training with good teachers in a good tradition and they've really found something. Um, so the, the mass of books, you have to find your way through them in order to find the few that really have something. And then I went in search of a teacher and um, that's what I recommend. First, first research the subject. And if there's some teacher that comes into your view, research the teacher. Don't just believe what they say look into their history because um, you know I had three major good teachers and each one of them had a long a long a lifetime history of learning from other good teachers and each one of them was supported in their teaching by their teachers so when you find someone who's like gone away from their teacher or rejected by the teacher or they've rejected their teacher it's like a broken tradition you have to be very careful or someone who didn't really have a teacher, they just read a lot of books and made up a system, put their name on it and charged some money for it. You can forget about those ones. So you have to look, look into the history of the teacher, see whether they um, teach freely, see whether they teach honestly, and make sure that they have a long tradition of learning with previous good teachers who have a long tradition of learning with previous good teachers. Cause, because the... What's necessary for real teaching is that there's some inner force that, and that comes down through these chains of teachers. So if the teacher is not a recipient of that type of force, um, it's, it will just be an external, out of, out of the, um, this big monkey brain that people have. You know, we have about three times the number of brain cells as a chimpanzee. Um, so that from the brain you can be quite smart, but it, will never work for the internal world. So, research, and when you start to look at teachers, research their background. Um, if, it, if the teacher claims to be like the Messiah, or the, you know, the greatest in the world, or if you come to them, they'll save you, and if you don't, you go away, and all of these Messiah complex things, if the teacher puts on too many shiny clothes and too many big hats, sits too high up, asks you to call them two fancy names, um, then you should also um, think twice about it. Because the best teachers that I ever met um, were very um, very humble, very normal people. And inside they were very high level, 
and out, outside you couldn't see it. And the people who appeared very big on the outside, inside were very small. That's another thing I appreciate about this system, that you look normal. I mean, you look yeah, like... I'm a, normal. <laughs> We know differently, though, don't we? But no, you, you present, the people in this system are not overly anything. They're not too weird. They're not too woo-woo. Right. These are a very lovely, normal... It's like a... It's a very wonderful community. And I think that's how you can also judge a great system and a good teacher is by the students. And you've had students for decades. You're absolutely right. I should have added it. Um, look at the students here. Look at the people who've been there for a long time and see what's happened. So are you happy? And does that scale even matter to you? <laughs> um, let me see. When the, when the inner part of you becomes stronger, which must happen if you train in a reasonable way for a long time. It just happens as a, it's like inner growth, inner evolution. Um, then when you are when you are following that inner part, there's a type of a contentment and a peace and a satisfaction. And when you're not following it, of course, there'll be a type of discontent in a slight unpeace in a, such a word, which is not. Um, uh, un uncomfortableness inside yourself and a tension inside yourself and so on so mm -hmm. when I'm when I'm following that inner part then I can say yes I'm very peaceful and if I if I slip, if I make some mistakes if I um, don't hold it all together perfectly then in that time I'm not happy with myself you might say um, but it's more just that you lose that um, deep inner peace sort of goes away a little and you realize you, know, you need to um, adjust the path a little bit back on in tune with uh, what's something that's deeper again. Do those moments happen less and less for you? Um, you well, you less, you less and less go swing to the side. So, you know, when, you get, when you're younger, um, sometimes you do things and then you realize that's like it's really not right in this, these terms. Um, so it's more like a just a slight waver. Oh, this could have been done slightly better, rather than wild, wildly off to the side. So it's a small, um, yeah, sm small wandering to the side of the path rather than wandering off the path. Right. Approaching the border of the path, no danger of going off and coming back. So thanks so much for watching this interview series. I'm Mia Park. It has been an honor to interview Patrick Kelly, my Tai Chi teacher. And make sure that you follow up and read about Patrick Kelly. There's the website ninecloudsch and patrickkellytaichi.com. And that information will be in the links provided. So thanks so much for watching, everyone. Thank you, Patrick. Ciao. Ciao. <laughs>